Welcome. Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to you all. My name is Peter Penoyer, and I am delighted to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Colin B. Bailey, director of the Morgan. As a member of Morgan's Board of Trustees and chair of its Building and Grounds Committee, it has been a pleasure to work with Colin and to watch the Morgan flourish under his leadership. Colin is a renowned scholar of 18th century and 19th century French art. Since his arrival as our director of the Morgan in, in 2015, he's also quickly become an expert on the history of this institution and its buildings. Tonight, he will speak to us about the development of J.P. Pierpont Morgan as a collector of rare books and manuscripts. His talk draws from an essay he and his colleague Daria Rose Foner authored for the new publication entitled J. Pierpont Morgan's Library, Building the Bookman's Paradise. And we're so pleased to celebrate the launch of this book tonight. Published by Scala Arts Publisher, this handsome book is filled with new scholarship, uh, really some amazingly insightful essays by uh, people who really analyze the building and understand the history. Uh, and it celebrates the multi-year exterior restoration of J. Pierpont Morgan's library and the creation of the new Morgan Garden. It was produced in conjunction with last summer's exhibition of the same name. I hope some of you were able to enjoy that uh, exhibition. Uh, books will be available uh, after the talk and Colin will be there to sign your copy or hopefully copies, it's a wonderful book. It might sell out, it might have to go into many extra printings, but you can get your copies tonight. Um, the restoration, the garden, the publication, and the exhibition were all made possible through the efforts and support of so many people, and, and I've seen several of you here uh, tonight, so I thank you. Um, I know that my fellow trustees and the staff of the Morgan will agree with me that it's an honor to steward this in, uh, institution and its great architecture for generations to come. So without further ado, I give you Colin Bailey. Thank you very much, Peter. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Peter alluded, this is this project, the restoration, the, the new garden, the new lighting, and the publication were the work of many, many people. I just want to recognize my colleagues, Jessica Ludwig and Brian Reagan, both of whom are here this evening, and to say how pleased I am that the book, which was on a very slow boat from China, finally arrived. Okay, so we'll start. So my, my hope this evening is to go from here, a shot of Morgan's uh, original library in his townhouse, to here, a, a, a very familiar sight to everyone here, in about 150 slides and no longer than 50 minutes. Um, in 1883, Artistic Houses being a series of interior views of, of a number of the most beautiful and celebrated homes in the United States, published an account of John Pierpont Morgan's brownstone at 219 Madison Avenue, recently refurbished by Christian Herter with electric lighting courtesy of Thomas Edison. The book contained photographs of the entrance hall, drawing room, dining room, and library. While there were low bookcases along the walls of Morgan's reception room and shelves eight feet high in his wife's morning room, Morgan's library itself, panelled in San Domingo mahogany, seemed to have, seems to have had very little space for books at all. And it's just possible to make out one set of low bookcases, uh, somewhere around here, um, in the stained glass screen by Lafarge that we see in this shot next to the conservatory. The same year, the 46-year-old financier commissioned a privately printed catalog of his library. The Morgan does not own a copy. In 1883, Morgan's library consisted primarily of modern editions of his favorite authors, Henry Fielding, Robert Burns, Sir Walter Scott, 
Charles Dickens, William, Tha William Thackeray, extensive holdings of the proceedings of the Protestant Episcopal Church in New York, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, a collection of 65 volumes devoted to his person personal childhood hero, Napoleon Bonaparte, and recent facsimile of Shakespeare's first folio printed in 1866, and the New Testament of the King James Bible, uh, a presentation copy of 1881, and Froissart's Chronicles of England, published in 1868. Only two items in this catalog stood out for their rarity or significance. Morgan had recently purchased a copy of John Eliot's Algonquin Bible from 1663, the first complete Bible printed on the North American continent for which he paid $1,000. Also remarkable was the collection of autographs and documents relating to the signers of the Declaration of Independence, Benjamin Franklin's signature here, and Button Gwinnett's signature here. Both items had been bound in Morocco leather by the leading London bookbinder, Francis Bedford, and the presentation of autographs and literary and historical manuscripts in volumes with elaborately tooled modern bindings uh, was an established practice in private libraries by this time. And I'm showing you an, a, a photograph of Lewis Comfort Tiffany's library with this idea in mind. Edith Wharton, whose elder brother, Frederick Jones, was a bookbinder in New York, stressed the importance of gilt-tooled leather bindings, quote, as an element of home decoration. In the opening chapter of Her House of Mirth, published in 1905, Wharton's hero, heroine, Lily Bart, has an assignation with the lawyer Lawrence Selden in his small library. Quote, some of the volumes had the ripe tints of good root tooling and old Morocco, and her eyes lingered on them caressingly. By 1902, in the two decades after the publication of Sabin's catalog, Morgan had amassed so many outstanding medieval and Renaissance illuminated manuscripts in Cunabula, early printed books and bindings, literary and historical manuscripts, that he undertook to house them in a freestanding library on the same block as his brownstone. He turned to Charles Follen McKim, who in April 1902 informed his partner, William Rutherford Mead, that they were to erect, quote, a little museum building to house Morgan's books and collections. The following month, Morgan's brief for his new library was communicated to McKim by his son-in-law, Herbert Livingston Sutterly, in consultation with Junius Spencer Morgan, on the right, Morgan's learned bibliophile nephew. The building was not intended as a reading library. Satterley wrote in May 1902, it's a collection of rare volumes. The present number of books is about 10,000, of which 3,000 are rarities or curiosities and are the type of volumes that are displayed under glass in most libraries. McKim had to amend his plans accordingly, and they were reviewed by Morgan towards the end of of July 1902 in London. Satterley had to relay the bad news that Morgan was not happy. As you can see, that is bad news. <laughs> McKim un had underestimated the size of the collections that were to be housed. Quote, to sum it up, I now get the impression that Mr. Morgan wants a library <clears throat> as large as the restrictions imposed by the deeds and as requirements of light and air and of his own house and our house and the houses on 37th Street in the rear will permit, and B, to contain twice as many books as you figured on, also vases, bric-a-brac, etc., with possible spaces for pictures, but not a picture gallery. Twice as many books as you figured on. From this, it would appear that Morgan was now anticipating that upon completion, his library might house as many as 20,000 volumes. Plenitude and abundance were certainly conveyed in the first published account of Morgan's great library, which appeared in the Times in December 1908, almost two years after the building had been completed. And you see on the right, Mr. Morgan's great library. The fortunate, if anonymous journalist, described the collections as they were arranged in the principal rooms of McKim's building. The East Room, which we see at far left, 
with bookshelves from floor to ceiling was devoted to incunabula, early English printed books, and liturgical collections. <clears throat> Two of the finest jeweled bindings were displayed in, in, gla in a glass table cabinet in the middle <clears throat> of that room. The Lindau Gospel on the left we will talk about in a minute, but on the right, a less familiar work is the commemoration of the decretals, which Morgan valued very highly, but which has been discovered to have been a Flemish 19th century fake. <clears throat> Morgan's all deans. Sorry. Morgan's all deans um, occupied 23 shelves, his Elzevirs, seven shelves, his Bibles, including two Gutenbergs, 30 shelves. And I'm showing you here beautiful all dean Petrarca from 1501 and the Hypnorotomachia Polyphily from 1498. More than 30, 20 Caxtons and other early English books were shelved on the other side of the room. Passing back through the rotunda, visitors entered Mr. Morgan's own library room. And this is a, an early color photograph by Arnold, Arnold Genther, dating from about 1910. They entered Mr. Morgan's own library room, not so large, but even more exquisite. Today, we know it as the West Room with lower bookshelves giving more room for old master paintings, sculpture, and maiolica. Here was housed Morgan's collections of French literature, fine bindings, and books belonging to notable personages. At the southeast, southeast corner, a burglar-proof and fireproof steel vault, which contained many of the most priceless things of the world. And these are quotes from the 1908 article. This treasure room housed, housed Morgan's illuminated manuscripts and books of ours, as well as his manuscripts of great English authors, Byron, Burns, Scott, the Brontes. Accompanied by the courteous librarian, the journalist ended his visit in an apartment on the second floor, given over to Morgan's prints, primarily his outstanding collection of Rembrandts and English mezzotints, and his Western tablets and ancient seals. Now, the creation <coughs> of the Bookman's Paradise, as it was called, at 33 East 36th Street, was but one aspect of Morgan's activity between 1898 and 1906 as the most voracious, discriminating, and ambitious collector of the Gilded Age. And in this celebrated cartoon from Punch, we see Morgan the Magnet bringing over every sort of object from European collections. It is a marvel, noted the British art historian, George Williamson, who was responsible for the catalog, catalogs of Morgan's miniatures, jewels, and watches. It is a marvel that any man working alone on his own responsibility and within the space of one lifetime should have brought together a collection which embraces the choicest examples from perhaps 50 different fields of craftsmanship. Beyond books and manuscripts, Morgan's avidity extended to Byzantine and medieval art, Renaissance bronzes, Limoges enamel, old master paintings, European 18th century decorative arts, and Chinese porcelains, not a whiff of the modern in any of his collecting. Now, since the Dingley Act of 1897, which had imposed a duty of 20% on imported works of art, with tariffs even higher for manufactured products such as furniture and tapestries, with this act in place, during Morgan's lifetime, most of his collections were held in London, at his mansion, at 13 to 14, 14 Prince's Gate, or on display in the loan court of the Victorian Albert Museum. Not so his library. Books and manuscripts were exempt from tax, as long as they were used for religious, educational, or scientific purposes. And Morgan was punctilious in avoiding duty whenever he could. In shipping his books back to New York, he insisted um, that the head, to the head of the family firm Quaritch that no duty be paid. And he wrote, I do not wish them ever insured. Consequently, that charge should hereafter be omitted. In the next place, I do not wish the books shipped through shipping experts. I wish them sent to Messrs. Im Ismay and Imre and Company, who were the proprietors of the White Star Line, which Morgan owned, and sent to Messrs. J.P. Morgan and Company in New York direct, also without the value being stated. This will save an immense deal of money to middlemen, which it is unnecessary to pay. We do not follow that directive today. 
Like many of Morgan's Gilded Age contemporaries, he, unlike, unlike many of his Gilded Age contemporaries, Henry Clay Frick on the left, Andrew Carnegie on the right, unlike these con contemporaries, Morgan came from a wealthy and established New England family, was well-educated, spoke French and German, having studied abroad in Switzerland and Germany. As a child and teenager, Morgan regularly received books from his parents and grandparents. He collected autographs and the signatures of famous men, and he took out an annual subscription to London Illustrated News. Autograph hunting was a hobby he shared with his favorite cousin, James Junius Goodwin. I have ha I've had half a promise of Prince Albert's autograph, Morgan wrote to him on May 1852, age 15. I wish you could send me on that autograph of Henry Clay. At L'Institut Sillig, the fashionable Swiss boarding school near Veve in Switzerland that Morgan attended between November 1854 and March 1856, Morgan was introduced to the writers of Beaumarchais and Madame de Stael. In 1856, he matriculated at the Georg August Universität in Göttingen, Germany, where there were bookstores and libraries on every street. He enthused to his cousin that the university library contained more than 450,000 volumes in every known language, ancient and modern, among them a magnificent vellum copy of the Gutenberg Bible. But from what we can glean of Morgan's literary tastes as a young man, his reading was unapologetically middle-brow. He preferred female Victorian novelists, sentimental Irish poets, and the seafaring tales of Frederick Marriott, a writer of historical fiction whose novels Morgan first read at the age of 16. In his first love and first wife, Amelia Memmi Sturgis, Morgan had found a slightly older, well-educated young woman who enjoyed Cooper, Cowper, Cooper, Byron, and Tennyson. His second wife, and the mother of his four children, Frances Tracy Morgan, was an avid reader who confided to, her fr to a friend in June 1872, we each have our ambitions, and mine is not elegant furniture. I prefer to spend the money on books and pictures and permanent things that thieves will not be tempted to break through and steal. The formidable Mrs. Morgan was also somewhat skeptical about her husband's collecting, claiming that Morgan, quote, would buy anything from a pyramid to Mary Magdalene's tooth. And indeed, in the Florentine 14th century reliquary on the right, Morgan thought he had acquired one of Mary Magdalene's teeth, <laughs> as it is, the reliquary, it is the relic that is contained in that vessel. A potent influence on Morgan's future collecting of literary and historical manuscripts was his beloved father, Junius Spencer Morgan, stern, critical, deeply engaged in Morgan's education and the launching of his banking career, Junius Morgan, who was resident in London since 1854, was also responsible for his son's first acquisition of a literary manuscript of any significance. Sir Walter Scott's three-volume manuscript of Guy Mannering, or The Astrologer, the best-selling novel of gypsies and smugglers in the Scottish Highlands, published anonymously in 1815, this was auctioned at the Earl of Clare sale at Sotheby's on the 31st of January, 1881. And here's a copy of the manuscript novel. <clears throat> Junius's, Junius' father, Junius Pear's agent, Henry Stephen, seen on the left, alerted him and received a promising response. If it's genuine beyond the possibility of a doubt, I should like to own it, i.e. if it can be had for any reasonable price. But what, that's, what some that word reasonable should represent, I don't know. You tell me you think it will sell for about 150 pounds to 400 pounds. The last figure seems large. Thus, I authorize you to go to about that retail. I put in the word about because I would not like you to lose it for a few pounds, but I shall depend upon your doing the best possible interest. For such a towering banker living in London and working with the Rothschilds and George Peabody, Junius's father was not exactly clear on the instructions to Henry Stevens. Morgan clearly wanted the Scott autographs. Do the best you can, only don't be very foolish. Stevens had apparently warned the other bidders in the auction room in London, you have a young American against you, Junius was 68 years old, you have a young American against you and you better go home. You haven't a glint of a chance. 
Morgan acquired the manuscript and gave it to his son later that year. Henry Stevens bought historical documents, autographs of famous men, and literary manuscripts to Junius Morgan, the father, regularly. But on only one occasion was he able to persuade him to acquire literary manuscripts of equal distinction to, the Matt, to Walter Scott's Guy Mannering. Three years later, in February 1884, Stevens far exceeded Morgan's commission of 150 pounds for a set of 19 of Lord Byron's letters to his mother. Junius was in Rome when Stevens placed the, bidding, the winning bid of 270 guineas. I'm quoting from his letter to Morgan. I settled off and settled and carried it off amid much applause, but there were many regrets expressed that such a volume should have been permitted to go to America. One gentleman, I think a reporter for the Times, asked me if it really was destined for America, but all I could tell him was that I acted for an American, but he might present it to the Queen for aught I knew. Junius did not present it to Queen Victoria. Over the years, and without any success, Henry Stevens had urged his wealthy client to consider buying entire libraries as they came onto the market. In August 1881, Stevens begged Morgan Senior to consider the greatest prize of all, the Sunderland Morbrugat Library at Blenheim, which was to be sold in London in a series of auctions between December 1881 and January 1883. His letter to Junius. If you desire to become a benefactor to your country, yourself and your family for all time, avail yourself of the grandest opportunity that ever occurred to a liberal man of means. The Duke of Marlborough's library is coming onto the market immediately and is likely to overfill it. The Duke obtained a dispensation from Parliament to break the entail and sell his library, and such a library. It unquestionably ranks as high as the third private library in existence. The Althrop, Earl Spencer, the Chatsworth, Duke of Devonshire, being superior to that of Blenheim Palace alone. Junius took no action, nor is it known if he ever discussed the matter with his son Pierpont, who at this stage harbored no such ambitions himself. How, to best, how best to approach and understand Morgan as a rare book and manuscript collector and account for the dramatic acceleration of activity and ambition around 1900 that led to his commissioning of the McKim, Mead and White Library and Masterpiece? How far was Morgan's library a reflection of his literary, scholarly or bibliographic tastes and interests? To what degree was he following established modes of royal and aristocratic libraries established in England and the continent. And I show you two, two, two watercolor views of the library at Windsor. While Morgan's immense appetite and decisiveness remain essential, his accumulation of outstanding examples of medieval and Renaissance illuminated manuscripts, printed books and bindings, literary and historical manuscripts, all of this owed a great deal to a trusted family advisor. In the years before the appointment of Bell de Costa Green as his librarian, the dominant influence of Morgan's bibliomania was his nephew, Junius Spencer Morgan, whose role in the creation of the Morgan Library, while recognized by everyone who has written on the subject, can be seen to be even more consequential than we previously thought. During the 1880s and 90s, Morgan's book and manuscript collections developed, to quote Jean Strauss, with no clear plan or direction. His interests remain consistent with those described in the early Sabin catalog of 1881, Bibles and liturgical works, Americana, literary manuscripts, and early editions of mainly 19th century British authors. But I'm showing you, of course, the first Gutenberg Bible that he acquires in 1896. <clears throat> a revealing reminiscence of Morgan the Collector in his 51st year was left by a bookseller, Frank Augustus Wheeler, who joined Pearson and Com Pearson and Company in the late 1880s in London and crossed the Atlantic to meet the firm's New York clients in the winter of 1888, when Morgan would have been 51. Wheeler, aged 23, was sent to Morgan's Wall Street offices for an appointment at noon. 
What have you got to show me? A Thackeray manuscript, which came from Thackeray's daughter. Mr. Morgan took it and turned over the leaves. You are sure that it is Thackeray's autograph? Quite certain. You are too young to be quite certain. I think not, because I've been dealing in manuscripts since I was 17. Very well. What's the price? 100 pounds. Is that cash? No, 90 pounds cash. Very well. My secretary will give you a check. Let me know if you have any really good author's manuscripts in the future. As we can see, Morgan was a decisive client, attentive to cost, but still with somewhat limited interests. Upon the death of his father, Junius, in April 1890, he had come into an inheritance of over $15 million and was now running J.S. Morgan & Company in London and Drexel Morgan & Company in New York. Yet the nature and scope of Morgan's collected did not immediately change. He spent more on the annual upkeep of his um, new yacht, Corsair II, commissioned in May 1890, than he did on his books and manuscripts. We know that Morgan was buying books, literary manuscripts, uh, and other volumes with increasing regularity during the 1890s, that he was becoming increasingly sophisticated as a collector of books and manuscripts. He had joined the Grolier Club on the 5th of January, 1897, just before his 60th birthday. <clears throat> but it was now that the influence of his 33-year-old nephew, Junius, became decisive in developing his uncle's interest in illuminated manuscripts, early printed books, and rare editions. The eldest child of Morgan's younger sister, Sarah Spencer, seen here on the left, and on the right, on the left of the trio, with young JP in the middle, the eldest child of, of, of Morgan's younger sister, Junius, was educated at St. Paul's School in Concord and Princeton University. from which he graduated with a degree of, in a, in a, 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 a Bachelor's of Arts degree in 1888 and a thorough grounding in ancient Greek and Latin authors. At 18, Junius had acquired his first rare book from a New York dealer. In 1887, during a summer in England with his grandfather at Dover House, he purchased rare books on visits to Edinburgh, Basel, and Paris. In 1890, 23-year-old Junius made his first acquisition of several early editions of Virgil and would quickly assemble the finest collection of Virgils in America, which he donated during his lifetime to the Princeton University Library. After graduation from Princeton in December 1888, Junius joined the recently established Grolier Club at Madison Avenue. At 21, he was his, the club's youngest member. He followed family example, worked as a banker and stockbroker in New York, although this was not a profession he much enjoyed. In June 1891, he married Josephine Adams Perry, a great niece of Commander Matthew Perry, who had played a crucial role in the opening of Japan to the West in the 1850s, with whom he would have two children. In 1897, he built Constitution Hill, a 30-room English Tudor revival home in Princeton. Junius became co-founder and senior partner of Coiler Morgan, Morgan and Company with offices at 44 Pine Street in the financial district. Junius was convivial, learned, and affectionate. To his fiancée, Josephine, he quipped, I'm afraid, my darling, that you think me a little cranky on books. Well, I suppose that I am. But he was also a determined and voracious collector. He, attended, he identified a number of rare editions in the March 1891 sale of the library of Brayton Ives, a former Civil War general and president of the New York Stock Exchange. For Junius, the prize of this sale was the earliest dated Virgil, uh, Vendelinus de Spira, 1470 in Venice, a vellum copy with an illuminated border which sold well beyond his means for $3,000. To his great surprise and delight, Uncle Pierpont expressed his disappointment that Junius had not secured the book and slipped $3,300 in cash into his nephew's hand. This allowed him to buy the book and pay the dealer's commission. Wasn't it splendid of my uncle, Junius informed Josie. I never knew anyone that was as generous as he. 
As Jean Strauss has noted, Morgan had always been able to acquire whatever he wanted. In his 60s, in the late 1890s, he wanted rare books, manuscripts, and art. For Morgan's collecting of old master paintings and the decorative arts, no less than his acquisitions of rare books and illuminated manuscripts, 1899 marked a turning point. It was an annus mirabilis. In January 1999, Morgan purchased Jean-Honoré Fragonard's series, The Pro Progress of Love, for $310,000. Today, up the street at the Frick Collection. He then went on to buy Raphael's Colonna masterpiece, now at the Metropolitan Museum, at a cost of $400,000. These, there's the Colonna, Colonna altarpiece. These sums were dwarfed by the $800,000 spent on acquiring and augmenting the garland collection of Chinese porcelains for the Metropolitan Museum. Morgan's quite sudden emergence around 1900-1902 as an avid book and manuscript collector dates from the very same period, and as we will see, the role played by Nephew Junius was again crucial. In the summer of 1899, Morgan acquired James Tuvey's collection of 4,000 books and bindings for 23,000 pounds, approximately $115,000. James Tuvey had been a distinguished Roman Catholic bookseller who had died in 1893 and whose London premises at Piccadilly were known as the Temple of Leather and Literature. Tuvey's library was renowned for more than 500 Aldines, editions of the classics printed by Venetian printer Aldus Minucius between 1495 and 1515, and we're seeing the Hypnorotomachia polyphily, um, as well as for its fine bindings and books from early English presses, including the Sydney Shakespeare's first folio, then considered the largest and most desirable example in existence. Purchased in July 19, 1899, 1899, this was Morgan's first acquisition of a library on block. Tuvi's library had included the Ragamala, an early 19th century Rajput manuscript with 36 miniatures illustrating traditional Hindu musical modes. Strictly speaking, this was the first illuminated manuscript to enter Morgan's collection, but it was soon eclipsed by the acquisition of the Lindau Gospels, a late 9th century Latin manuscript of the Gospels in a treasure binding composed of two exceptionally fine Carolingian jeweled metalwork book covers. The upper cover embellished with no fewer than 327 emeralds, sapphires, pearls, and other precious stones, all of which are authentic and genuine as they were tested some years ago by the Morgan, given the habit of English aristocratic collectors to replace the real gems with paste. Bertram, fourth Earl of Ashburnham, had assembled the lion's share of his illuminated manuscripts in the 1840s. He had offered, after his death, the collection had been offered to the British Museum for 160,000 pounds, but they had declined to acquire everything. The Lindau Gospels, purchased by Ashburnham in 1846 for 340 guineas, had been held back from public sale. And on the 3rd of July, 1899, Junius Morgan, who happened to be in London for a wedding, was invited to Sotheby's to examine it. The next day, Junius wrote breathlessly to dear uncle about the availability of what he called the Ashburnham Evangelarium. I am told there is nothing to compare with it in the, in the British Museum or in Paris, and that only in the treasury of Cologne Cathedral will you find its equal. Ashburnham's son and heir, the fifth Earl, was insisting on an asking price of $10,000, the equivalent of 10,000 pounds, the equivalent of $50,000. Junius continued, it is a marvelous thing and extraordinarily interesting and valuable, probably nothing of its kind more so. I sincerely hope that you will decide to buy this great treasure. Morgan would only take possession of the Lindau Gospels in 1901, since the British government delayed export for two years in an attempt to raise funds. 
On 18th of January 1901, the Times of London, as we see here, announced the sale and the price, 10,000 pounds, to a purchaser who does not wish his name to appear, but who, it may be said, is not an inhabitant of England. Following the Tuvi acquisition and the Lindau Gospel in the summer of 1899, Junius was now responsible for the second library to enter Morgan's collection on blog. In March and April 18, 1900, he brokered the acquisition of some 3,200 volumes and 272 prints by Rembrandt from the Oswego New York manufacturer and financier Theodore Irvin, for which Morgan paid around $180,000. Having started out in grain and flour, this agribusiness millionaire had diversified into banking, transportation, and utilities. Among the high spots and most expensive acquisitions in Irwin's collection was the Old Testament portrait of the Gutenberg Bible on paper, the Golden Gospels of Henry VIII, a 10th century purple manuscript with burnished golden lettering, the late 15th century editions of Livy and Virgil's St. Augustine's De Civitati Dei, printed by Nicholas Jensen in Venice in October 1475 with this divine illuminated frontispiece by Girolamo de Cremona. Such was Morgan's confidence in Junius's judgment that he agreed to this acquisition sight unseen. On the 28th of March, 1900, Morgan was booked to sail to Europe on the Teutonic with his recently engaged daughter, Louisa. He would buy her wedding trousseau and dresses at Worth in Paris. Two days before embarking, he and Junius met to discuss Irwin's library. I've seen a good deal of uncle today and am very busy trying to buy for him another library, Junius reported to his wife. He will not be able to see them, the books, himself, and it puts a lot of responsibility on me. I expect to go up and look at them sometime this afternoon. As you can imagine, I'm pretty well excited at the prospect of putting through another library sale. In the spring of 1902, Morgan made Far and Away the most important addition to his library, which established its preeminence in the field of illuminated manuscripts, incunabula, and early printed books. He paid 130,000 pounds, over $650,000, for the, quote, small, very remarkable library of 107 illuminated manuscripts and 600 early books assembled by the English manufacturer, Richard Bennett. Bennett's main idea for his library was to, quote, to exemplify the development of the early illustrated book starting from illuminated manuscripts through the block books and onward to finished typographic specimens. And I'm showing you a couple of examples of his finest block books from the 15th century. With very few exceptions, everything in the Bennett collection dated to before the year 1500. Once again, Junius was responsible for promoting the acquisition and overseeing negotiations with Bennett's London agents and he would continue to work on the catalog of the Bennett collection for several years to come. We have no idea what Bennett looked like. He's one of the most mysterious and un un unknown figures in, late night in, in Victorian England, but he was a, 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 an exemplary and astonishing collector. He was born near Bolton in Lancashire. He made his fortune in the bleaching and chemical industries, was living at Lever Hall, Great Lever, in the suburbs of Bolton, and by the mid-1890s had moved to Ravensdale in Worsley, a suburb of Manchester. He was also an outstanding collector of violins and stringed instruments, who during his lifetime owned no fewer than 24 Stradivariuses, or Stradivari, as, they, as we say. And his, bibli his bibliomania seems to have developed quite suddenly in April 1897, when he bought the poet and textile designer William Morris's library en bloc, and then went on to add 32 Caxtons at the Ashburnham sale. Bennett, as uh, an early historian has written, was a conscientious objector to large folios, and he limited the height of his books to no more than 13 inches. <laughs> Among his block books, Books of Hours, in Cunabula, he boasted superlative early English manuscripts, such as the Worksop Bestuary, 
written in, uh, illuminated in London, Lincoln or York around 1180, the early 13th century Huntingsfield Psalter, and the early 14th century Tiptoft Missal. After receiving a synopsis of the Bennett Library, Morgan immediately cabled his interest. And on the 26th of February, 1902, an assistant from London uh, fled, uh, sailed to New York to discuss the transaction with Morgan in person. Naturally enough, the first thing Morgan did was to consult his nephew, Junius, who left a few days afterwards for London to inspect the collection. Junius arrived in London at noon on Saturday, March 22, 1902, settling into a very good small apartment at Claridge's and went to work on Monday at Sotheby's to review the Bennett Library. Yesterday, I started out on the mission that brought me here, he informed his wife. It is certainly a most remarkable collection of books. After Mr. Tuvey and I looked at them for a short while, he said, get your uncle to buy them no matter what they cost him. They are a wonderful lot and one can't put a value on them. Junius was, uh, was indicating his English friend's accent in his letter. The very week that Junius was at Sotheby's examining Bennett's book, his uncle Pierpont was interviewing Charles Follen McKim at breakfast for the commission to build his library. Quickly after that, Morgan went to London and was expected on April the 9th. As Junius told his wife, I must be bustling to get the books in position for him to look at them tomorrow. I don't think he'll buy them, but in my judgment, they are worth what a man has to give for them if he wants them. They are a very superb lot. In good form, after a smooth crossing to Southampton where Morgan and his daughter Anne were met by a private train to take them to Euston Station, Morgan must have seen the books on the afternoon of Thursday, the 9th of April, or the morning of Friday, April 10th, and he made an offer. Junius, nephew Junius, was exultant. I think JP, if he wanted to have fine books, has done a very good thing in buying them. It's a small lot, something under 700 volumes, but they are very remarkable. Julius also advised his uncle to pay 130,000 pounds rather than Bennett's asking price of 150,000 pounds. During the construction of Morgan's library between 1902 and 1906, Junius acted also as his uncle's unofficial librarian. He advised on shelving and casework. He served as an occasional conduit for decisions on the building's exterior architecture and interior decoration. Not surprisingly, Junius was most involved in the design and fabrication of the library's bookshelves and bookcases, including the construction of the vault. A memorandum summarizing his proposals was drawn up at the offices of McKim, Mead and White on October 24th, 1904. I'm quoting from it. Glass for doors is not necessary nor advisable. The fronts of the cases should be of metal, preferably bronze, and the size of uprights, etc., should be as small as possible in order that all books may be easily seen. The door should be filled with some metal grill or screen, but to be kept open, the screen being intended to prevent the removal of books from the cases. Junius also advised on systems of hinges, locks, keys, which remove the need for knobs or handles on the doors. These recommendations were followed in the construction of the Circassian walnut bookcases in the East and West rooms. As McKim's building took shape, Morgan continued to buy books and manuscripts at a significant pace, and Junius continued to advise him to monitor his purchases and to authorize payments. Junius was also overseeing the facsimile edition of the Bennett Catalogues, four-volume publication with detailed entries and descriptions by the most eminent British scholars of the day, and illustrated with exceptionally fine facsimiles. This series of catalogues was four years in the making and may have cost more than 20,000 pounds to produce. When the first set arrived in New York in December 1906, Morgan cabled his enthusiasm, catalogue received, and delighted. The Bennett volumes set a new standard in scholarship. As the scholar and former Morgan curator, Paul Needham, has noted, the formulation of the entries for early printing was the most detailed and scholarly that had as yet been applied to the description of incunables. Curiously, given his role in the purchase of the Lindau Gospels, 
Junius did not play a part in one of his uncle's most spectacular acquisitions, the Book of Hours, illuminated by Giulio Clovio in 1546 for Cardinal Alessandro Farnese. This was Morgan's most sumptuously illuminated manuscript. He bought it in May 1903 during his annual cure at Les Bons, and he was so taken with this magnificent volume that he carried it on board home with him to New York. Similarly representative of Morgan's now highly developed aesthetic sensibility was his acquisition of William Blake's 21 watercolors for the Book of Job in 1805. He paid 6,000 pounds for this. The Farnese hours and the Blake illustrations, while very different, are indicative of Morgan's taste for the exalted depiction of religious subject matter, and they were also harbingers of an interest in old master drawings and watercolors for which the Morgan collection is known so, so well today. Drawings had never been a part of Morgan's collecting until 1909, when he acquired 1,500 sheets, and I'm showing you Parmaginino on the left and Rubens on the right, he acquired 1,500 sheets from the collection formed by Charles Fairfax Murray and paying 50,000 pounds for them, equivalent of $250,000. Once again, Junius, who had been responsible for his uncle's extensive collection of Rembrandt etchings, encouraged Morgan's taste for works on paper. In June 1906, he and his uncle visited the Grange, Fairfax Murray's house in West Kensington, to see his wonderful things, books, drawings, engravings, pictures, a perfect museum. Despite having a full-time position as a senior partner in a Wall Street brokerage house, Junius, as, we have, as we've seen, also performed many of the more onerous duties associated with his uncle's book buying. By now, he had a very promising assistant in mind, for, the, for his uncle, 26-year-old Belle de Costa Green, who had worked at Princeton University Library since 1902, where Morgan, where Junius was associate librarian. Junius introduced Belle to his uncle. An early account describes the first meeting. Seated massively at his desk that day in 1905, John Pierpont Morgan seemed lost in thought. He hardly even bothered to look up when his nephew Junius appeared before him with a slim, gray-eyed girl in tow. Uncle, said Junius, this is Miss Green. Thereupon Morgan grunted a how do you do, and the interview was over. Thus, scarcely out of her teens, quaking with fear and shaking like a leaf, Belle de Costa Green began her career as head of the Pierpont Morgan Library. And, Bell's, and Junius's first mention of Bell in his correspondence establishes that she was working for Morgan in as early as August 1905, month, several, several months earlier than we had thought. During 1906, Bell worked as an assistant to Mr. Junius, who still approved invoices for acquisitions, and she signed her letters assistant librarian, as we see here. Junius continued to identify manuscripts and incunabula for his uncle, and the last major purchase made by Morgan on Junius's recommendation was the illuminated hours of Claude Mollet, dated 1500, then ascribed to Jean Bourdichon, which was sent to approval in New York in May 1909. But in the summer of 1909, Junius would undergo, undergo a grave emotional crisis. On the 15th of August, he announced to his wife, who was on holiday with their children in Nova Scotia, that he was leaving her and moving to Paris immediately. The situation is impossible, he wrote. You must see it yourself. The fault lies entirely with me, and I shall have to take the consequences of the blame. He sailed for Europe two days later. Many factors precipitated Junius's sudden departure, which are partially explained in a letter that Belle de Costa Green wrote to Bernard Berenson, her long-distance lover and long-time correspondent, the day Junius left for Europe. She writes, at present he is in poor physical condition. He's in bad shape, not very lovable in accepting his defeat with poor grace. He feels very bitterly about it and says his opponent was elected by political moves equaled only by Tammany. Belle in this cryptic letter was alluding to the professional crisis in which Junius and his business partner, Cornelius Cornelius and Coiler, had been outmaneuvered and removed from their brokerage house by two of their former partners, 
whose behavior, Bell noted, had been so reprehensible. Junius did not return to America for four years, and his relationship with his uncle and his cousin Jack seems to have come to an end. He missed his uncle's funeral on the 14th of April, 1913, and it would not be until just Christmas of that year, on a subsequent trip to the Atlant across the Atlantic, that Junius once again visited the library he had helped to build. Morgan's en bloc purchases between 1899 and 1904 transformed the character, quality, and ambition of his library. As in his professional life, Morgan deferred to trusted specialists who had gained and were able to maintain his confidence in their expertise. With regard to his library, as we've seen, he turned above all to his nephew Junius, and in the years following Junius' departure from America, to Belle de Costa Green. But he remained very much his own man. The English art historian George Williamson recalled Morgan's outburst at a dinner party. He writes, he was not accustomed, he said, to be told by anyone that he must do such and such an action. No one says must to me. I shall buy it if I like, and I shan't if I don't like. From the winter of 1906, during the months that he was resident in New York, Morgan spent more and more time in his new library, which his partners now refer to the uptown branch of the bank. And of course, it was in these spaces that the panic of 1907 was allayed by Morgan's vigilance and his locking the door, allowing no one to leave until pledges were made. Um, he spent more and more time in, his, in the library. Yet despite his deep affection for McKim's neo-Renaissance building and his growing dependence on his first librarian, Belle de Costa Green, Morgan left no clear instructions for the library's future. In his will, he asked only that his son, Jack, continue to employ Bell as, a libra as librarian thereof at a salary not less than that which he should be receiving at the time of my death. Your real collector values a thing for its rarity. I don't suppose the buyers of Americana sit up reading them all night. Wharton's collect, this is a quote from Edith Wharton, her, collect her collector of horribly dull Americana the tedious and very rich Percy Grice, whose affections Lily Bart toys with and loses early on in the House of Mirth, this collector is not condemned for treating his books and documents as possessions. Three years after the incorporation of the Pierpont Morgan Library in 1924, the Philadelphia antiquarian and bookseller, A.S.W. Rosenbach, praised this recent acquisitiveness among American collectors as, quote, a wonderful and magnificent thing. As a consequence, Rosenberg wrote, Rosenbach wrote, the gathering of books in this country is in the hands of leaders of her industries, the so-called business kings, and not in the hands of college professors and great scholars. This, Rosenbach concluded, was how great libraries that might eventually become public institutions were formed. While Morgan's collecting of exceptional illuminated manuscripts incunabula, early printed books, historical bindings, developed only in the last 15 years of his life, there were certain continuities to his taste. Most notable was an interest in Bibles, and this is a subject that we will be looking at in an exhibition coming this autumn. Most notable was his interest in Bibles, liturgical books, books of common prayer, hymnals, as well as documents and autographs relating to the ecclesiastical figures of the past. Morgan was a generous supporter of the American Protestant Episcopal Church, a senior warden of St. George's Episcopal Church at Stuyvesant Square, and from the tender age of 14, an enthusiastic observer of Episcopal conventions. At the library, Belle Green would read passages of the Bible aloud to her employer, and Morgan greatly enjoyed Sunday evening hymn singing, which I think he conducted alone. In his letter of the 10th of September, 1914, to Herbert Satterley, Morgan's son-in-law, our, our, our young dealer, now no, no longer so young, Frank Wheeler, recalled that his firm had been supplying Morgan's with Bibles and religious books since 1898. He wrote, Morgan now possessed the finest collection in the world of the earliest editions of the Bible in all languages. 
His early hymn books matched his Bibles and liturgical collections in importance. Not only was Morgan an exacting client, Wheeler wrote, who hated an imperfect book, but he was also an exceptionally knowledgeable one. Wheeler concluded that of all the collectors he had known, Morgan seemed to me, by nature, the keenest, the most generous, the most appreciative, and by far, the kindest. Thank you very much. Thank you.